So the panelists today are Tal Golan, Department of History, UC San Diego, and he specializes in the history of science in the 18th and 19th centuries and in the relations between science, technology, and law. And we already heard um, some very interesting comments from the earlier speakers today, so we look forward to hearing from him. Our second panelist will be Nadav Davidovich. Uh, Nadav is joining us by Skype, and we're very touched by his presence here because he has had a family emergency, and so he cannot be here in person. But we're really very touched and honored that he has taken the time out now to join us by Skype. Um, he's affiliated with the history and ethics of public health at Columbia University, New York, also with the School of Public Health at Illinois, Chicago. Um, and our final panelist will be um, Emily McKee. She's an assistant professor at Northern Illinois University, and she specializes in environmental and Middle East anthropology. Um, so we're very delighted to have all of our three distinguished guests. And without further ado, I'm going to turn over the mic to Tal Golan, who will make the first presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, Miri, thank you for inviting me. This is shaping up to be an excellent uh, event. So I'm looking forward to learn a lot of things here. I'm going to talk about the waterway system in Israel. Uh, not uh, so much in its Palestinian Israeli context, but as a internal story of Israeli society, the Zionist project, uh, from a pioneering society to a neoliberal society, and what it means to the natural waterway. Um, okay. Um, so uh, Israel, or Palestine, as it uh, called by some of the people, um, is a semi-arid area, but uh, waterways that existed flew quite well for centuries, right? But all these change in the 20th century. Um, massive population growth, uh, let's see. How do I get here to my presentation? All right, so um, Massive population growth and rapidly expanding modern economy mounted pressure on the water resources all over the region. By the end of the 1960s, the young Israeli state virtually tapped all available fresh water at their source to meet its ever-growing needs. And what happened is that the stream beds became outlet to the sea of the, for the wastewater of modern Israel agriculture runoffs, industrial waste, and domestic sewage. Uh, now my story will concentrate on one of the rivers, the Kishon River in northern Israel, because it reflects very well those changes. Uh, of all Israeli waterways, the Kishon probably suffered the worst fate. The river runs first, so the river comes out at the north end of the Samara, Samaria mountain range, and it drains, it drains, the, it goes to the sea here. This is the Kishon, right here, okay? Um, it runs first to the Jez Jezreel Valley, uh, where it, it drains the runoff water, which are heavy with fertilizer and pesticides from the intensive, intensively cultivated fields. The river then cuts through the northern metropolitan area where it used to serve as a receptacle for an ever-growing urban load. Finally, the Kishon rubs backs with Israel's largest industrial ports at the Haifa Bay with its dense cluster of heavy in the industries, shipyards, refineries, petrochemical plants, etc., all discharging their wastewater directly into the water course. So what's interesting about the Kishon, it represents, if you will, the achievement of the modern Israeli state. It's agriculture, it's industry, 
its urban development. Uh, and at the same time, it suffers the consequences or try to take them away to the sea. So it's an interesting story that we have here, I think. Now, the Kishon might have been able to carry this heavy burden uh, to the open sea, but in 1953, as part of the National Water Project, Israel Nas National Water Company, Mekorot, dammed the Kishon upper watershed and redirected its flow to an artificial lake. Here it is. Artificial lake in the Jezreel um, uh, Valley to be used for irrigation during the long dry summer season. The capturing of the headwater tra transformed the lower part of the Kishon into um, ephemeral stream with li little capacity to carry its heavy agriculture, municipal and industrial deposits into the sea. Thereafter, the lower Kishon quickly deteriorated. By the 1970s, scientists described the river as so heavily contaminated with industrial waste that it wiped out any signal of biological life. And public officials strongly warned against any direct human contact with the water. Now, the deterioration of the Kishon was monitored closely by scientists and administrators since the mid-1950s. And the reports were digested at least by five high-level committees that looked into, into the Kishon growing problem during the 1960s and 70s. But the Kishon continued to deteriorate. And we can ask why. And some of the reasons were administrative in nature. Water pollution, following British uh, policy, was treated as local nuisance to be regulated by local authorities which gave permits to licensed businesses in their juris jurisdictions to discharge their wastewater into the municipal sewer system, provided that their wastewater satisfies certain criteria. But the local authorities were often the main sources of such effluents and had little incentive to abate them. This lack of political will was further augmented by an incoherent political structure. The refinery, refineries, by the terms of their British license, constituted a special zone free from regu regular municipal jurisdiction. The Kishon Harbor, too, was out of municipal court control. And other parts of the Kishon were under the control of various local authorities, each one operating independently. But the leniency should not be reduced to political contingencies. It was an attitude rooted deep in the ide ideological core of the infant state, which was overwhelmingly concerned with the development of its infrastructure. Well aware of the country's meager water supply, Israeli legislator had developed early on a powerful legal framework to administrate the water resources. Topping those efforts early on was the 1959 water law that vested ownership of all water resources below and above ground in the state and equipped the Water Commissioner Agency with extensive, extensive powers uh, uh, to oversee the allocation and protection of these water resources. But this regulative machinery did not consider all drops of water, all drops of water alike. Settlement plans were rarely abandoned because of the cost of uh, water supply. But water escaping to the sea exhorted far less consideration. The establishment in 1966 of a new government-owned plant, Haifa Chemicals, on the bank of the Kishon could illustrate further the environmental consequence of this Zionist ideology. Well, um, this is how the plant looks like at night. Using original patented processes, Haifa chemicals converted Israeli rocks that were mined and shipped from the Negev into valuable products for use in agriculture, industry, and food production. Nothing, at the time at least, came closer to the Zionist dream of a flourishing, sophisticated industry built upon Jewish brilliance and local resources. Still, becoming a global producer of fertilizers, 
Haifa chemicals quickly became the Kishon worst polluter, discharging thousands of cubic meters of toxic waste into the river daily. Keep in mind, though, that the industrial effluent was not the only sort pouring into the Kishon. A much larger source was the domestic sewage, generated by the growing population in the region. To address the problem, a regional sewage treatment plant was erected in 1961, the first in the country on the bank of the Kishon. But the capacity of the plant was quickly outstripped by the growing population, and as the overload built up, the plant's output deteriorated and malfunction multiplied, ending up in the Kishon water, uh, a lot of raw and certainly hefty discharge soon overpassed the natural flow of the river. Now, during the 1970s, the treatment plan went through a major upgrade, which was a part of an overall reorient reorientation of the national water policy, which was driven by the growing recognition that the young country had, has reached its limit in developing freshwater resources. The massive, massive activities involved in the national water carrier had come to their conclusion and the influential water community turned to the development of wastewater recycling projects. The 1970s saw Israel developing advanced scientific and administrative expertise in water reclamation, quality management, and conservation. However, this new program was dri driven by the same old ideology, that is, by the growing gap between the ideological objectives and the realities of water supply. The goal was to have treated wastewater supplying the greater part of agriculture irrigation. By collecting the improved output of the regional sewage treatment plants in seasonal impounds where they were diluted with agriculture runoff and used for summer irrigation. As far as the Kishon River, without the large domestic discharge from the treatment plan, the flow in the river farther weakened and was now dominated by toxic industrial wastewater, which were too dangerous or pricey or difficult to recycle. Okay, so this is the first part of my talk, uh, which I basically want to argue that the demise of the Kishon was considered an acceptable price, perhaps necessary for progress and prosperity of a pioneering society. The second part is what happened to a society once it matured and the pricing system or value is changing, making the Kishon uh, into a different object, uh, a proving ground for the morality and viability of a flourishing society. Um, the change started in late 1970s um, with the fall from power of the socialist camp, which were at the helm since the early days of the century, and the rise to power of the liberal right coalition that came to be known as the Likud. Some of the implications of this change were indicated early on by the new head of the Knesset powerful internal affairs committee, Yosef Tamir, a liberal lawyer who had little sympathy with the agricultural sector, and promptly added environmental protection to the committee's title and ordered the water commissioner to take immediate action to reduce the pollution in the Kishon. The water commission reluctantly moved into action. In 1978, it issued an execu executive order to 10 of the largest polluting plants, which specified the new quality standard for the wastewaters that all industrial effluents must comply with. The new standard was any, anything but harsh. Nevertheless, to comply, new filtering technology had to be introduced and possibly also a change in the raw materials and production processes. All these represented a financial burden that the plants were reluctant to carry alone without significant government help, which was not forthcoming. Now, the industrial cluster situated at the Kishon estuary could offer tremendous political resistance. The plant played a central role in Israel economy, and some of the bigger plants were actually owned by the government. Moreover, the plants provided a livelihood to thousands of residents in the Haifa area and were backed, therefore, by the Istadrut, 
Israel powerful umbrella labor union, which controlled much of the local politics. Facing resistance high and low, the water commissioner avoided confrontation, abstained from taking punitive actions, and th thought instead to cultivate cooperation through ongoing negotiation. The plans responded with delay and evasion, doing just enough to avoid sanction, but never enough to fully comply. The 1980s saw therefore a little change in the Kishon, but the toxic sedimentation uh, continued to accumulate at the bottom of the Kishon, slowly choking it. And finally, in the stormy winter of 1992, the lower Kishon overflowed, covering extensive industrial areas with thick toxic sludge and, massive, and moving massive quantities of it into the Haifa Bay. The flooding and its large cleaning bills added new pressures on the political system, and in 1994, a new administrative board was created, the Kishon River Authority, to administer the political, legal, scientific, and administrative effort needed for its rehabilitation. The new Kishon Authority was supervised by the Young Ministry of the Environment that was established just six years earlier, 1988. But the Young Ministry was poorly funded and enjoyed neither political cooperation nor public attention. On the other hand, the industrial cluster, which was by now privatized and internationalized by the 1990s, continued to wield tremendous political influence. And any attempt to enforce measures that would add to the cost of production was bound to be presented as a threat to the viability not only of the plants, but of the entire region and even the nation at large. The Kishon Authority failed, therefore, to make immediate mark on the politics of the Kishon. Nevertheless, the establishment of the ministry and the authority reflected an important change in Israeli politics, which was affected by the globalization and the privatization, which are two different phases of the same processes, I think, of environmental politics. So let's talk about environmental politics. Until the 1980s, environmental activism in Israel was the monopoly of a single civil organization called the Society for the Protection of Nature, a grassroots organi organization that worked through accepted state channels and focused on education and recreation. But the 1990s saw a rise of a new and more aggressive kind of environmental activism, imported to Israel by American Jews who immigrated to Israel. The most important one of them was called Israel Union for the Environmental Defense. Okay. Um, and the Kishon came up early on the IUED agenda. It was the most polluted waterway in Israel. The polluters were known. The evidence was available. The case was winnable. The problem was that the legal means to pursue the case were all concentrated in the hands of the state. Some were deposited with the water commissioner uh, who refused to go to battle with powerful rival over water loss to the sea. Others were at the hands of the local municip municipalities, which were among the largest polluters and did little to stop it. But this political grip, tight political grip, started to, began to loosen up in the late 1980s under the growing pressures of international law. Israel was privy to the international negotiation that culminated in 1976 Barcelona, Barcelona Convention for the protection of the Mediterranean against pollution, and later moved to ratify the various protocols of the, conference, of the convention uh, during the late 1980s. Okay? Now, among other things, the new legislation allowed for the first time public interest group properly certified as such by the Ministry of the Interior to initiate legal action in the name of the public. In addition, the powerful water law was also amended in 1991 to allow any person injured as a result of offense to the water law to bring private criminal. So this is the part of the privatization. Usually people talk of privatization in the context of business in Israel, but actually also environmental pro uh, uh, politics were privatized in Israel, and they made a huge change. Okay, and so in 1994, the fledgling IUED, the Inter Israeli Union for Environmental Defense, surprised everyone by entering a series of criminal suits against the management of the polluting plants along the lower Kishon. 
And after two years of hard battle, the private suit accomplished what no amount of previous intergovernmental wranglings has been able to do. Haifa Chemical was forced to sign a legally binding agreement that require it for the first time to abide by a written industrial waste standard with a clear timetable to do so and a crowded list of sanctions if it fails to do so. The ratification of the Barcelona Protocols gave teeth also to the Kishon Authority and the Ministry of the Environment, especially the Protocols for the Protection of the Mediterranean Sea Against Pollution from Land-Based Sources, which was legislated in the late 80s and became operational in the 1990s. It mandated that every discharge into the Mediterranean must be authorized. To that end, an interministerial ministerial committee uh, was established, headed by the Minister, Ministry of the Environment, which agreed to provide permits to land-based plants only in return for demonstrated improvement in their treatment facilities. Left with little choice, the plant upgraded their treatment facilities, and uh, the neighboring municipality also did so. And by the end of the 20th century, the Kishon started to improve uh, under those things. One more minute and I'm done. But not all scenes, not all past scenes could be washed that easily uh, to the sea um, because in 2000 it turned out there was a huge scandal in Israel. It turns out that uh, one of the um, uh, elite units in the army was secretly training in the river for the past half a century. And the veterans of this unit was now claiming that because of those trainings they got a rush of cancers among them uh, and they sued the military. And, uh, uh, and the military, afraid to open the floodgates against similar suits by other soldiers, refused uh, to, uh, to recognize them and deny the connection between the polluted river and the cancers. I'm not going to go through this controversy, but the point is that this controversy opened up a very painful, you know, the uh, dispute between the state and some of its most appreciated soldiers. And in Israel, the social contract between soldiers and, and, and the families and the army is one of the most basic unifying theme. All of this turned the Kishon into a proving ground, of, into a moral tale, and basically pushed the government to improve the Kishon and, and, and making it uh, a testimony for the morality and the prosperity of, of, of the government. So the Kishon now got a lot of resources and becoming like a flag demonstration for the prosperity of Israel. That's how it looks these days. And lately Netanyahu also announced a huge project to cleaning out the, this thick sludge from the bottom of it. And so this is the story of the Kishon from uh, an acceptable price for progress to a testing ground for the morality of the neoliberal state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tal. I'd now like to invite Nadav Davidovich to give his presentation. And you're reminded that he is joining us by Skype. So thank you very much, Nadal, for joining us. And I'm turning the mic over to you now. Hi, uh, people hear me? OK, so um, thanks uh, for organizers, especially for uh, Miri. Uh, it's a very sad time for my family, but I'm happy to be here uh, uh, with you. And I think in many ways, Edmund uh, Tal's uh, paper, he was talking mainly about um, quality of water. I'll be talking about quantity of water. I'll be talking about different uh, political aspects. Uh, I, I'm a public health physician, also did a PhD in history and sociology of science. Uh, my, my main position is at Ben Gurion University where I'm chairing the Center for Health Policy Research. So my paper is titled Public Health, Human Rights and Dual, Dual Loyalty Water Policies Towards the Unrecognized Bedouin Arab Villages in South Israel. And uh, one of my main questions here, part of environmental health policy in general, 
is also about a, a, um, it's a criticism of traditional bioethics uh, and moving to public health ethics and bringing uh, the political dimension uh, uh, to it. So while bioethics help healthcare professionals identify and respond to legal and moral dilemmas in their work, there has been growing interest in separating public health ethics from clinical bioethics. Public health is one function of the complex relationship between the state, institutions, and citizens. Therefore, a conceptualization of public health ethics should account also for the social political basis of this relationship. The case study I will present today is on access to water in the unrecognized Bedouin villages in Israel, aims to encourage debate on the contextualization of politics in public health ethics, inter alia through a discussion on the role, responsibilities, and as I suggest, the dual loyalty dilemma of public health professionals working in a politically conflictual context. So I will start about uh, some general comments about water, health rights, and public health ethics. The right to health, to water, sorry, is acknowledged as the basic universal human right interrelated to other rights, including the right to health and to an adequate standard of living. From this perspective, it is the state obligation to ensure the availability, accessibility, and quality of water for all persons under its governance. It has to do so in an equitable manner and with special consideration of marginalized groups. Rights-based approaches to health employ various mechanisms to hold governments accountable for the realization of the right to water. They may seek redress for rights violations. They may use human rights norms as a framework for proactive policy development they may mobilize civil society to take action, or they may do several of the above concomitantly. The classic biotical principles were commonly based on the principle of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And with the principle of justice requiring the equitable distribution of benefits burdens. Some authors underscore that reducing uh, inequalities, and here I'm, I'm quoting, by improving the health of the worth of groups is among the highest priorities of public health research policy and practice. The rise of public health ethics as a distinct field in the last two decades, complementary yet in tension with the more individualistic oriented clinical bioethics, brought to the fore ethical questions to the role and responsibility of the state when dealing with minorities' health and health disparities. And, and here I'm moving to the question of, of uh, equitable access to water, perceived as a key factor due to its potential not only to reduce the global burden of disease, but also to help reduce socioeconomic and health discrepancies. For example, better access to water alone could reduce the global prevalence of diarrheal diseases and trachoma, eye infectious disease, by 25%, thus helping mainly the poorest populations to lead more healthy and productive lives. Uh, this is from the organization. From a public health ethics point of view, it is far not as the result of human action, stemming, for example, from pollution or deliberately unequal distribution. However, growing scarcity of water and socio-political decisions such as the privatization jeopardize the chances for more equitable water accessibility. The UN development report pinpoints, for example, that many times, I'm quoting, scarcity is manufactured through political processes and institutions that disadvantage the poor, end quote. So, for instance, as we all know, political and social conflicts play out on water distribution when the party in power abuses access to water as leverage against other population groups. So in this paper, I want to describe the case of the unrecognized Bedouin villages 
as a context in which political considerations and goals are central in shaping governmental policies on water allocation to a minority group. I argue that this creates dilemmas for public health professionals employed with the government in as much as such situation forces them to choose between values and principle and shrink in the professional ethical code and loyalty to the government. So a little bit about the unrecognized Bedouin uh, villages in the south of Israel. Unrecognized Bedouin villages existed prior to the establishment of the state of Israel. During the war that broke out following the establishment of the state in 1948, many of then about 70 to 90,000 Bedouin Arab residents looked for refuge in neighboring countries. Only about 11,000 remained and became Israeli citizens. From 1948-1953, they were transferred to one confined zone under military rule. After 1965, a national outline plan stipulated the Bedouin Arab communities transfer to seven designated urban style towns, thus subjecting them to an involuntary process of sedentarization and so-called modernization. The pre-existing Bedouin Arab villages disappeared from official maps the land becoming state land. Today, half of the Bedouin Arab population of the region, approximately 90,000 persons, lives in the state land towns. Many others have stayed on their land and re-established villages, which the Israeli government considers now illegal settlement. So today, up to 90,000 persons live in these unrecognized Bedouin Arab villages. As a result of the governmental non-recognition, they are not provided basic social determinants of health such as water, sewage, or electricity. And also social services such as health and education uh, are not entirely available. The privation of the land has led to the loss of livelihoods and rapid socioeconomic and social cultural transition. Today, the Bedouin Arab communities are the weakest socioeconomic groups in Israeli society. Compared to the above described means of total coercion, such as denial of infrastructure and services, house demolitions are also another violent means to force Bedouin Arab families off their land. Thus, until today, its policies towards the unrecognized Bedouin villages reflect the government determination to concentrate the Bedouin Arab population in specified urban settlements while turning the land into many Jewish uh, urban development, industrial or agricultural areas, and closed military zones. Just to give you some uh, indicators, fertility rates among the Bedouin Arab population is 5.6 compared to 2.7 among the Jewish population. This is true for 2011. More than 60% of the population is below the age of 17 years. And in spite of recent improvements, and I must say that the Minister of Health is investing lots of energies in the field, infant mortality rates continue to be two to threefold higher than those among the Jewish population of the same district and considerably higher than those among the general Israeli Muslim population. And now to water allocation and consumption. Water is considered a common good in Israel. Most of the Israeli population enjoys supply of safe, potable water. However, a distinct water distribution system pertains to the unrecognized Bedouin villages. At least 10 families have to jointly apply to a special water committee. The committee is made up of representatives of the police, the Israeli army, the Ministry of Interior, and other state bodies. Neither the Ministry of Health nor the communities are represented and decision-making processes are not made transparent. So to give an example, between 2003 and 2006, 86% in numbers, 180 applications were denied in accordance with the committee's recommendations. To date, there are some 300 central water points in the unrecognized Bedouin villages. And this is following a Supreme Court decision. Each point is shared by an average of 250 persons and their livestock. The respective household average consumption is 100 liters per day compared to 
somewhere between 170, 350 liters per day in Jewish localities in the region. The water points are up to eight, <coughs> eight kilometers, which is five, about five miles from the homes, and thus inaccessible according to World Health Organization standards and maintenance of individual connections from the central water point to their homes. They often lay pipelines on the ground in which the water becomes boiling hot in summer and freezes in winter. Okay, so you have a catch-22 because the central point is approved by the Supreme Court, but then you cannot connect it, this point to the specific houses. More than half of the unrecognized Bedouin village residents do not have a water point. They travel long distances several times a week and wait for hours in line in order to fill containers at the filling point at high cost. The containers used by unrecognized villages residents to transport and store water are often exposed to the sun for days. The water becomes hot, turbid, and ridden with algae and rust. And eventually, many families are required to get water also from unchecked sources such as well. Recently, water prices applying to the unrecognized villages which are without prior notice. In face of above logistic and financial challenges, many families are forced to extensively limit the water consumption. So now I'll bring the Minister of Health uh, into the question, into the story. The Minister of Health plays only a very limited role in political decision-making processes on the unrecognized Bedouin village water supply. It is mainly responsible for monitoring water quality at the central water point. The Ministry of Infrastructure determines the water policy in turn is implemented by the above described water commission. Mekorot, a government owned company, is the main water supplier. The body is regarded as legitimate representative by the villages, such as the Regional Council for the Unrecognized Villages, are themselves unrecognized by the authorities. Under the current arrangement, the institution of the Israeli water economy are accountable only for the central water points, while responsibility for individual connections and water quality at household level is shifted to the families. Such arrangements exacerbate inequalities and fuel pre-existing tensions between and within the communities as families that have obtained a water connection have an interest in selling water at higher price to others. The arrangement thus carries the common features of privatization, and that's another form of privatization following tal presentation, including the shift of responsibilities from the state to the individual and growing disparities. The Ministry of Health last water quality survey in the unrecognized villages dates back to 1995, almost 20 years ago. It concluded that both pipeline and well water exposed the consumer to severe health risks, namely bacterial infections. Excess morbidity rates in Bedouin and our population are well documented, especially with regard to infectious diseases and respiratory diseases among children. However, no comprehensive epidemiological studies have been undertaken that link high prevalence of health problems among unrecognized villages population to the question of their access to water. Accepting responsibility only for water quality at the central water point the Minister of Health refuses to make any statements regarding water allocation, thus distancing itself from the political dimension as they perceive of the dispute between the Bedouin Arab communities and the state. In this case, this means that the Minister of Health remains passive in a situation in which a population is denied the basic determinant of health that is sufficient and adequate water supply. So how we can understand the public health professional specificity in the face of the above described situation? What can explain the apparent lack of agency to find and promote solutions that reflect principles of public health ethics and health rights? By the issue of the professional ethical code, public health professionals are bound to work towards equity and justice in the distribution of health and its social determinants. To this end, they are to design and implement public health policies that will mitigate redress and compensate for the health ramification of socioeconomic and social political disadvantages. This basic tenet suggests that the role of public health professionals ought to be proactive and political one, also in the context of adverse socio political conditions. And here I would like to quote from, from a textbook 
for public health ethics, the health professionals participating in an equitable system has an obligation to press for alternative policies designed to change this state of affairs. Rather than adjust one behavior to the constraints imposed by discrimination or the state failure to develop a fair and equitable allocation of health resources, the health professional should act to change it. Yet, of course, on the other hand, public health professionals in Israel work within the political framework envisioned by the Israeli government, that is, their employer. And the government overall political with line with vis a vis the unrecognized villages. This can mean, of course, that a person working within the Ministry of Health can have a question about his personal and professional consequences of promoting opposed public health policies that in our case studies policies that foster equitable and adequate water provision to the Bedouin Arab communities. It also means that the Ministry of Health operates within a particular framework that may at times constrain its action, for example, by limiting public health intervention to less political and more medicalized areas such as vaccination or screening. I don't know if you, how many of you are, uh, were aware of the last polio campaign in Israel, but the Israeli Ministry of Health invested tons of energies doing vaccination among Bedouin unrecognized villages, but vaccination is a much more medicalized solution that they feel much more uh, uh, ready and much more easier for them to, to work within this framework. So while the improvement of vaccination rates among the Bedouin Arab communities is undoubtedly important, and I salute the Minister of Health for that, it can be perceived as less challenging to the political status quo than, than bringing water to the unrecognized Bedouin villages. The related predicaments can be described within a dual loyalty framework according to what is defined by the International Dual Loyalty Working Group definition, and I'm quoting, as clinical role conflict between professional duties to a patient and obligation expressed or implied, real or perceived, to the interests of a third party such an employer, insurer, or the state. The political conflict between the unrecognized Bedouin village and the state may thus permeate policy-making processes down to the level of public health professionals, individuals, choice and decisions. And now to my conclusion. Our case study has illustrated that the government current water policy vis-a-vis -vis unrecognized Bedouin villages connect the question of water supply to the conflict between the Bedouin Arab communities and the state. The struggle over land ownership thus overshadows planning processes, overriding other value-based and professional considerations, including public health, educational, urban planning, and environmental concerns. Such policy turn access to water into leverage in a political conflict. This paper furthermore points out public health professional widespread silence and passivity, unfortunately, and I was working formerly in the Ministry of Health and I know very well these people and I respect them and I think they're doing an amazing work, but still the silence and passivity in view of the denial of some basic determinants of health to the Bedouin Arab communities in contrast to other public health measures such as vaccination that I mentioned. I suggest that the basis of this silence and passivity lies at least at part of it in the dual loyalty conflict between professional ethical obligation towards communities in question and also within the larger question of how the frame, what is the framework uh, of how the problem is being, is being framed. We know that bioethical codes of conduct offer little support and guidance to public health professionals in such situations. The UN bodies have declared that access to water is a human right. Several authors have demanded that this right should be taken more seriously and translated into public health action. These case studies underscores this demand in adding a focus on the context-specific political framework of the access to water. This focus, which is frequently missing in our analysis, strengthens the argument that access to water should be dealt with as a matter of basic human rights and public health ethics in order to prevent abuse as leverage in a political conflict. Accordingly, the Minister of Health, as a professional body responsible for environmental and public health, should adopt a more proactive role in matters of water allocations. Finally, recontextualizing 
the issue in wider framework of public health ethics and open the forum for public health professionals to engage in meaningful civic participation. This way, growing public health challenges associated with migration, ethnic conflicts, environmental degradation can be better understood within the social and political context. With regard to issues such as water allocation, the problem resolution process could be eased if all involved parties would reframe the water question as a common cause. In the particular Israeli context, as well as in other contexts worldwide, and of course this case study is repeated unfortunately in many other countries, the ecological and political significance of water could be an opportunity for cooperation among the different stakeholders en route to greater sustainability and peace. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Nadav, for that very thought-provoking talk. And now I would like to welcome our last panelist, Emily McKee. Uh, we're now turning from a couple of case studies in Israel to some cross-border case studies, um, the borders which Summer talked about the creation of um, earlier today. So as we all know from our work in this field, uh, efforts to coordinate water use across uh, Palestinian, Israeli, and Jordanian boundaries face social and political difficulties. This is a region of high NGO turnover in all domains, uh, fleeting political deals, and great social distance between residents. Um, water projects uh, face specific challenges tied to the regional history of water management we've heard a bit about and the material qualities of water. It's true that water does not respect political borders as environmental NGOs and international bodies like the UN have emphasized. Such voices insist that people must think of and manage water through its boundaries, so developing what's often called as watershed thinking. However, cross-border water projects do not simply edu educate residents from a blank slate. Rather, they intervene in complex, socially and politically shaped worldviews of water, which I refer to as water worlds. While analysts may more typically refer to waterscapes as the collection of watery places and water-moving technologies that people live within, uh, the term water worlds approaches similar places and relationships, but from residents' perspectives. Through ethnographic accounts such as Veronica Strang's in Australia and England and Shaley Muhlman's work um, on the Colorado River across the U.S. and Mexico borders, we know that water, conf water and water conflicts um, manifest according to local meanings and struggles. One group along a river may be debating the management of water and how best to allocate it, uh, while downriver residents facing a collapsed fishing industry aren't actually specifically focused on the river itself, but are worried about finding any work that they can. Um, in one setting, water scarcity may be understood as a barrier to economic profit, while on another portion of that same river, folks might be more concerned with um, water scarcity as an affront to human dignity and hygiene. Sorry about the knocking. <laughs> Though the two groups in either case may inhabit the same waterscapes, um, they have very per different perspectives. They perceive different water worlds. So I use this term to evoke the web of connections that water may have from a given social perspective. Like worldviews, water worlds may seem to be culturally totalizing and bounded, especially when I talk about Jordanian and Palestinian water views, water worlds. Um, but they are situational and not bounded geographically. They can shift with changing technologies and governance regimes, as well as in the presence of different audiences. For those of us scholars and practitioners alike who are concerned with protecting the waterscapes that intersect with Israel and Palestine, we must attend to these particular manifestations, these water worlds. This paper is a work in, prog in, in progress, um, processing through some of the field work I've done so far among both cross-border water justice and conservation activists, um, and residents of Israel, Jordan, and Palestine from 2011 to the present. So this includes two months of uh, participant observation and interviewing with one case study NGO, Friends of the Earth Middle East, in um, their multiple offices in Tel Aviv, Bethlehem, and Amman. Um, and during that time I did, um, I participated in field work with them and, and interviewed staff from each of their offices. 
Um, and then in more recently, I spent two and a half months investigating residents' priorities and practices, primarily in two communities along the Jordan River. Uh, one is a rural uh, northern Jordan village, which I give a pseudonym, Moaz. And the other is an Israeli kibbutz, which I call Nativa Hamisha, or just Nativ for short. Uh, among Palestinians, I've made some observations in Bethlehem and, and brief site visits in the Jordan River Valley and Hebron regions, and I'm planning more field work this year. So very much a work in progress. Um, today, looking at one part of this endeavor, I'll share some of my initial findings on residents' understandings of water. And my research suggests that water is actually a different thing for residents of Moaz than it is just across the river in Nativ. Knowing how water is different for these potential partners in cooperative use, and how particular policies, delivery networks, and economic systems shape these understandings can help us develop more practicable and equitable solutions. The holistic viewpoint and socially situated nature of ethnographic fieldwork I think is best suited to finding out these kinds of questions about water worlds. Um, so, so far I've, I've identified four particularly salient issues that differ between these water worlds. Um, and I'll discuss two in some detail and then just mention the other two. Um, and we'll be very interested to hear what you all find uh, most compelling or most questionable among them. One central challenge to working across political borders for any sort of water reform is that residents on each side may hold very different senses of certainty about their water supply, both in terms of its quality and its quantity. Infrastructure is one major factor shaping these senses. So for residents of Muaz uh, in Jordan, water is an ephemeral, unpredictable thing. State authorities in Jordan have built infrastructure and provided drinking water for several decades but it arrives to residents' faucets infrequently and in limited quantities. Most residents identified water as coming from El Solta, the, the water authority, but don't identify specific sources um, from which that water comes. Time and again during interviews, residents explain that water may arrive in their pipes every week on their turn, or it may not arrive for several weeks. When it comes, it may come for just a couple hours or the full day. Um, and then when water does not flow, and even with frugal use, the tanks on their rooftops run dry, residents buy water delivered in tanker trucks by private distributors. Um, and few residents even venture to guess as to where the water from those tanker trucks originally comes from. There's great uncertainty about the water's quality, too. Some Muez residents worry that even the government-provided tap water carries what they refer to as terasa boot, these unspecified deposits. Um, which they believe cause kidney problems and they insist on filtering or boiling the water, while others t trust its safety and drink it unfiltered. Residents' notions of the quality of tanker water were even more hazy. Uh, there are government-approved tankers um, that deliver potable water in green tanks and non-drinking water in blue tanks, but residents rarely volunteered this difference when they were explaining the, the quality of water to me. Whether unaware of the distinction or unconvinced, that government-monitored potable water was significantly diff safer than non-potable water. Uh, water quality was not something about which residents felt certainty. At the same time, local conventions for using the village's spring waters have collapsed. Uh, the water has a productive mineral water, water spring here that used to have an open pool at its source and a system of canals. Uh, tourists came to swim in the pool and bring money into the local economy. Um, and a schedule of turn-taking uh, use, used to distrib distribute water between uh, the farmers that were further along on these canals. But several years ago, a failed business deal closed this pool uh, to visitors, causing economic decline, and then individuals began opening small spas of their own and diverting water from the spring. Uh, so now downhill farmers are angry uh, with the spa operators because their water flows have become much less predictable and smaller. So this uncertainty about water appears to foreshorten the time scale within which residents value and use it. Residents use water intensively during the hours it flows and very sparingly at other times. Uh, at my host family's uh, home, for example, the arrival of water from El Sulta occasioned a burst of activity. Uh, so once the rooftop storage tanks had filled, women from the household sent several loads of laundry through the washers, um, washed all of the floors, even cleaned the dust off the patio with, with um, hoses, um, but during other times used it very sparingly. Across the border, 
different restrictions and opportunities as well as residents' perceptions of their own political potency to shape infrastructure made waterscapes more predictable. In Israel, what residents knew when they would have access to water and where it would come from. And here I'll note that in the region in northern Israel that I'm dealing with, there were no unrecognized villages. So the, the situation that Nadav is speaking of is very different. And th so throughout this case study valley, um, there's separate canal and pipe networks that deliver water from different sources with different salinity levels as well, um, but all with consistent flow, so rather than coming once a week. From my first afternoon in, in Nativa Hamisha, when Oren sat me down in the, the ecotourism office to explain to me what each of their water sources was, um, residents regularly described these sources. So they named the deep mountain wells um, that supply their drinking water, the valley springs that give saline water to um, agricultural enterprises throughout the region, as well as the local springs from which only Nativ uh, draws water for its fish raising business. Participation in local water management is also relatively widely distributed as the Regional Water Association includes members from most of the area, Moshavim and Kibbutzim. Um, during my last day on the kibbutz, a water cut became uh, in some ways the exception that proved the rule. So I was copying archival material in the office when a call came that a supply pipe had burst and drinking water would need to be shut down for the kibbutz. Um, but the secretary's fluster and the flurry of phone calls that res resulted suggested how very rare an occurrence this was, so rare that no bottled water was even kept in the dining hall, I found. Um, but within four hours, the main had been repaired and water returned to the pipes. So water is a steady feature of Nativ's household and farming landscapes. The transparency in water planning and budgeting, as well as knowledge of the particular sources and their salinity levels, makes water a known and predictable entity. Likely as a result, residents engage a really complex calculus to assign value to and use different kinds of water. Um, and so though I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this right now, residents' certainty about the salinity levels and the different pricing that went along with these salinity levels was key. Um, this allows area farmers to engage in long-term planning and budgeting, as well as research and development into different kinds of agricultural enterprises that use these different kinds of water. And I mentioned value a moment ago, um, and the ways water is assigned value constitute a second key feature of these water worlds. Using pricing to control water consumption is a common approach, approach of water planners, but it was very controversial among re um, regional residents. In large-scale reform plans proposed by international donors, two principles, uh, belief in a rational, normative consumer who will use less water um, once the prices rise, and the need for cost recovery, these two things often associate raising water prices with a modern, efficient water delivery system. However, these such pricing plans are also ways of asserting power, and opinions on their efficacy and justice are largely divided among regional residents along class and nationality lines. Israelis with whom I spoke uh, widely agreed with cost controls. In Nativ, residents pointed to their own recent experiences with privatization as evidence. Uh, so like many kibbutzim in Israel, Nativ was once an economic collective um, and until the 1990s, as was the case, services they received in turn for their work um, and membership in the kibbutz included water to their homes. In 2010, the kibbutz installed meters to charge residents uh, for the volume that they used. As one resident who knew the figures on consumption before and after privatization told me, quote, so the behavior, in short, it is very simple. The minute they started to pay, for money, pay money, they started to decrease the amount of water being used. And I'm telling you, it is no different from all privatization of any other area, end quote. Concerns about the negative consequences of individualizing costs seemed to center entirely on aesthetics. Uh, many residents lamented that once water costs rose, uh, their neighbors simply shut off the sprinklers and let their lawns die turning brown and ugly like this. Um, as we sat in the kibbutz office one morning, a lifelong member told me, quote, if you had come here four or five years ago, you would have seen it all green, all lawn. Today, it's already desert, end quote. However, these aesthetics also hold deep moral meanings for residents, especially for the generation that built the kibbutz. Given Zionism's charge to green the desert and the deeply Zionist commitment that many residents felt, 
To admit that the kibbutz has turned back to desert was to suggest some degree of failure in their mission to green this wilderness. To counter the browning of their kibbutz, members decided to put drought-tolerant plants in public spaces and run new water lines through the kibbutz that would carry a separate um, pipe full of saline, relatively saline agricultural water. This would keep certain areas of symbolic collective importance green, including the lawn by the dining hall, around the swimming pool, and under the kibbutz's original guard tower. Both the choice of where to water and the great work and insistence that went into keeping wide lawns in some places are strong indicators of the moral importance of aesthetics. Specifically, water use for the communal pool pictured here, um, as well as residents' explanations for its importance, demonstrate central struggles within the native community over questions of individual rights and responsibilities to the nation. Stories of the kibbutz's early years always include description of the beastly hot, dry weather and the founder's sacrifice for the greater good of Israel. And at least some of the residents saw their recent cutback um, on water as a, quote, Zionist act, answering a call in the country, on all of the country's residents to conserve a scarce resource. However, center periphery, center periphery relations within Israel can be tense, with periphery residents feeling that their harsher lives subsidize more comfortable lives in the center, uh, center being around Tel Aviv and Jerusalem area. So for some residents, features like the swimming pool and lawns are well-earned rewards. One evening, as I sat chatting with one of the kibbutz's strongest advocates for water-saving plants, he asked me, have you been to the pool to relax? Yes, I replied. So you've seen it, it's like Ireland, he said. Because he, the pool manager, pours water on it, and I think it's right. When people live in a place like this, you deserve a place to go to that looks like Ireland." End quote. So in this view, water use for aesthetics is a right, um, something earned by periphery residents regardless of national water scarcity. Whereas at a national scale, water use and distribution were deeply moral issues, at an international scale, water could be treated as just another commodity. As one native resident stated when I asked whether Israel should give more water to, to Jordan, quote, I think that yes, there's no choice. They don't even have a place to desalinate from, but what's to give? They'll pay for it. There's no giving here, no gifts here." End quote. In general, though residents were aware of water deals between, uh, with Jordan and the Palestinian Authority, few weighed in on the fairness um, of these negotiation issues. Israel's relative water wealth seemed to make discussion at an international scale politically uncomfortable for these residents, most of whom considered themselves leftists. In Jordan, many agreed that higher prices encourage frugality, but objected that many residents are simply too, pay, too poor to pay more. A connection to water authority lines costs an initial outlay of about 200 JD, $280, um, while the monthly income for a family on social development assistance is between 100 and 180 JD. One afternoon, my Jordanian host took me to a neighbor um, who was among the poorest in Moaz, we sat on several torn mattresses, laid on the concrete floor of the family's one-room home, as an elderly man, Rashid, explained his lack of piped water. The subscription fee is expensive, and Rashid could not provide a sulta with his, with his home's license since a new room had recently been added for his married son. Confused by the bureaucracy, he seemed uncomfortable as my host tried to clarify what paperwork and payments he had already submitted. So finally, he threw up his hands in frustration, explaining his son's inability to find work, and exclaimed simply, there is no money. With no connection to the public supply, Rashid turns, like many families, to private deliverers. But this tanked water is about 20 times more expensive than public water per cubic meter, which quickly diminishes his government stipend. So Rashid feels caught in a cycle of untenable bills and baffling bureaucracy. The next day, I visited a regional water administrator, engineer Wasim, in his office and told him of Rashid's dilemma. I asked how such a problem should be solved. There are payment plans for poor families, Wasim replied, and besides, he would be willing to bet the family has other luxuries like a phone. Quote, it, the money, is not a problem. It's a problem of management, let's say, and planning by that poor person, end quote. So what seems great frustration is the refusal of each Jordanian citizen to realize his responsibilities. He calls loudly for his rights, Wasim said, but fails to admit that, quote, you must pay the bills in order for the government to be able to serve you, end quote. So Rashid and Wasim demonstrate Jordanians' disputed notions of responsibility. 
Many residents expected the most powerful to provide this necessity of life to the masses. These explicit calls on the government or international donors to provide imply a connection between power and responsibility. And this expectation is, is consistent, I'd argue, with a monarchy where the king is portrayed as a patriarchal caregiver and where powerful families gained their, their position largely as providers for the less powerful families around them. So loyalty is owed to one's provider. In contrast, Wasim calls on, on residents to take individual responsibility and consider their impact on the national water supply to orient uh, themselves as members of a Jordanian nation, not just a tribe or family. So these debates about individual responsibility and resources um, are enmeshed in larger societal debates about modern political reform, in quotes, um, and the role of tribes in Jordan. So without time to expand on the, the other two issues, um, I'll address them just very briefly. First, social suffering. Trying to change water use behavior with any reference to the wider region triggers memories and narratives of social suffering tied to Israeli-Arab conflict. Kibbutz members discuss their sacrifices in choosing a harshly arid plot by the border, exposed to shelling from militants during the settlement's early years. They highlight their industrious use of water to make this green spot in the desert. Palestinian and Jordanian villagers speak of the unfair monopoly that Israel took over water. Relative deprivation, so the awareness of one's own scarcity in relation to the relative abundance around them, um, was very important for these residents. Such senses of suffering and mistrust can lead residents uh, to shun cooperative water management as, quote, collaborating with hostile Arabs or delegitimizing Israel on the one hand, or as normalizing occupation on the other hand. Um, so second, when I refer to salts, I'm referring to two things. Uh, first, my research has shown the context dependency of definitions of good or quality water. So there's no uniform understanding regarding salinity, organic and mineral content, or temperature across these different um, economic systems. And second, desalination is becoming increasingly important, particularly now that large quantities of water can be desalinated in Israel at relatively low cost. It's unclear how this technology will influence water use, but it does seem to be changing residents' understandings of water scarcity and of the geopolitical importance of fresh water. So in some ways, decoupling, decoupling territorial conflict from um, water access. Um, so analysis of residents' understandings of water as a substance and as an element of their social worlds is useful for scholars and practitioners in cross-border projects. In either role, we need to know what moder water means to the water users with whom we work. The water worlds perceived by Jordanians, Israelis, and Palestinians can be very different, stemming from more material and systemic differences than can be changed by environmental education alone. From the pipes and canals bringing water to residents, to the governance norms that regulate information flows and price changes, to the livelihoods these water this water sustains and the family structures that organize them, very different realities face Jordanians, Palestinians, and Israelis. This talk has focused on differences between water worlds. There are, of course, key similarities, some of which have facilitated cross-border projects from their beginning, such as arid climate and concerns over scarcity. Um, my focus on differences aims to facilitate water projects that take the priorities of residents seriously so that differences can be understood and bridged rather than paved over or put aside. So I've suggested certainty, sense, salt, and suffering constitute four issues of particular salience. Um, and these issues combine infrastructure, power, relation, power relations, and political discourse. So cross-border projects require both cultural translation work between these water worlds, um, as well as dealing with the material differences that these residents are facing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Emily, and um, thanks to all the speakers of this really fascinating panel. Um, I read all the papers um, last week, what I was thinking about my remarks, and I was uh, really impressed by the breadth of issues they raised around Israeli and Palestinian waterways. So to me, one of the most interesting things was reading these papers and listening to these talks, because I don't come from a Middle East water background, to me, what was really interesting 
is the transparency of acceptance of the symbolic value of water in all of these panels and talks, as well as uh, the morning's panel. If you compare it to the analyses of a basin with which I'm more familiar, the Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Basin, shared by many countries, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, China, um, Bhutan, Water is mainly talked about as competitive in its multiple uses, agriculture, drinking, industry, um, ecosystem uses, a little bit maybe fisheries, but there, it, the competition in this literature is the competition for water. The dilemmas and problems are, are around water as a resource. What I found exceptionally interesting about this set of panelists, and as I said, the mornings one, morning ones also, is very different kinds of competition and very different kinds of dilemmas and conflicts were raised by these talks. For example, let us take Tal's discussion. This discussion was on the Kishon, not merely as a carrier of water, for which water had competitive uses, but a direct discussion of the role of this Kishan in state making and the competition between its financial value to various entities in the state and its ecosystem value, which the lawsuit that Alan Tal and his group brought raised. Let us take the second kind of competition that these papers reveal raised by Nadav. Here you see that water is being denied to the uh, Bedouin region, but not denied to other regions. And the competition here and the conflict here is amongst the physicians who are now torn between their duty to suffering people as physicians and their duty to the state of Israel as loyal citizens. This too is a competition generated by the uses of water. Let's look at the third competition we find in Emily's paper. This is a competition and a dilemma and a conflict of meaning, where to some people, for example, in the native kibbutz that she discusses, there is a symbolic value and a deservingness to having water and beautiful lawns when you live in a place like this, as her admirer of Ireland told her, and versus the suffering of Rashid, who says, life is harsh. You know, I can't pay my bills. I can't deal with life. What am I supposed to do? You know, the, the, the meaning of water to the people in the Jordanian area that she worked in are extremely different. So it was fascinating to me to see how the multiple competitions and dilemmas generated by water seem to be about many things other than water. And it's refreshing to me to see that tackled head on in this panel because I don't think that all the other multiple basins where there is competition for water are so transparent about the symbolic value of water, the water's use as an instrument in state making. Let's look at the, but if we, if we transparently look at it as its use in state making, uh, we see its manifestations in all of these talks. We see the manifestations of the state-making function of water as opposed to the water-providing function of water. We see this manifestation in Nadav's talk where water is deliberately withheld from certain regions in order to prevent settlement. By the way, this is also true in parts of California's Central Valley. There are towns in California's Central Valley where by mandate um, certain communities were considered, quote unquote, unviable, and that they would go into natural decline. And because there was going to be natural decline anyway, we're going to withhold sewerage and water services from them because they're naturally unviable. So this is not unique to um, the Israeli-Palestinian situation by any means. Another manifest, also a manifestation of state power. Another manifestation of state power that we see in Tal's talk is that not all drops of water were treated equal, he says. Certain uses of water are going to be denied, but the settlements are never going to be denied because it's a manifestation of state power. 
we see this manifestation of state power and state making, more than manifestation of state power, water as state making, in Emily's discussion, where on the one hand, pricing is treated as something that is a rational response to scarce water, but in yesterday's talk, we heard that there was discussion of desalinated water from the Ashkelon potentially going into pepper production. It's clearly not rational in some contexts, but rational pricing is not rational in some contexts, but rational in others, because we see water as a state-making instrument beyond its own, you know, its wateriness, so to speak. And this really leads me to Samer's talk earlier this morning. He made a very strong case. He said, bring back the materiality. A lot of the economics literature that I'm familiar with is all about the materiality of water. To some extent, we have to sometimes push analysts to look at its symbolic value. Here, the symbolic value and the instrumental value of water dominates, and I, I want to conclude my discussion with an agreement with Samer's call this morning to bring back the materiality, bring back its intrinsic value in our discourse, because that intrinsic value may be something that people across borders are likely to resonate with over time, even if not immediately, and are likely to understand as potentially drawing people together as opposed to the act of state making, which inevitably cannot draw people together. Because discourse has material effect, and because discourse also has symbolic effect, it is very important, I think, to enlarge this discussion overall into the intrinsic value and the material value of water above and beyond its symbolic value and its value in state making primarily. So thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this panel. I'd like to, I'd like to open up now to the floor for questions. Um, I'm sure you realize, since we are running a little bit behind, we are going to have to steal a little bit of time from lunch, but um, I know that few talks can be so fascinating that they overcome the power of the stomach, and so we'll just try to steal maybe 15 minutes. Is that okay? 12.15? We'll open up instead of 12? Uh, thank you. I have a, a question for Emily, and also at the break, I want to give you a reference to a paper on some interviews of Jordanian households on water use. But Emily, when you talked about um, the pricing of water, you talked about it in the context of privatization. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the only economist in the room, and pricing water is not equivalent to privatization. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about that connection that you made. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Um, so in part, this is using emic definitions and not being entirely clear about when I'm using my informant's definitions and when I'm using my own. But in general, when folks talk about pricing water, especially in Israel, but also to some extent in Jordan, um, they talk about it as privatization because in most places where, where individuals haven't felt the pricing themselves, it's because they're in these collective kibbutzim um, settings. So when when folks talked about pricing reform in, in the kibbutz, it was pretty much always in the context of their experience of privatization. Um, when the kibbutz went from collective to um, individual household paying for water. Um, in Jordan, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the pricing subsidies are both national and international donor led. Um, so when when there's discussion about pricing reforms, trying to um, regularize or raise, depending on the vocabulary, costs, um, folks respond to it in terms of, this isn't something I should have to pay for individually, this is something that should be subsidized by the larger good, excuse me. So that's why I, I refer to it as privatization. It's, I'm not an economist, so there may be a particular definition of privatization that I'm not familiar with. So um, I noticed that Nadav was very clear about um, his orientation of social justice and how it is important to declare oneself 
in a certain way that it's not really a question. So, so for Emily, for example, I was wondering about the um, one, you focus on meaning, and I was wondering if you can say something about how that relates to material kind of frameworks, right? Um, the other thing is, are all meanings equal or are they not? And if they are not, what makes, what makes the case for social justice that is really different from, uh, I mean, you, you talked about power relations, but I was wondering if you can at least um, like elaborate a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we have to look at meaning and materiality as entirely co-constitutive. Um, I mean, the, to give one example, the understanding that a resident has of what gray water is, what reused water is, whether it's dirty, polluting, or an efficient logical economic solution is going to change the way they use it and the way they, or, or block the project. Um, so these kinds of meaning materiality things are totally tied together. And the meaning that they understand is based on the materiality that they perceive. Do they perceive there to be um, dirty particles still in the water or um, the, the life force and waste of somebody else is still in that water so they don't want to drink it, right? Or put it on their crops. Um, so I think they're in, entirely bound up together and, and how we understand boundaries, as you were talking about too, is, is very much, it creates even more strict material um, boundaries in the land when we see things in a particular way. Um, so it's a, it's a cyclical co-constitutive process. Um, for the social justice question, um, at least for my project in particular, I see this very much as sort of step one, figuring out where people are in their understandings of watersheds, because I think, I think this is not where I would like to stop my work, but this is trying to understand how you have a meaningful dialogue with people one has to understand the kinds of perceptions that they have first to then be able to try to bring about a more just solution where people see real, they, there, are, there are blinders on, on, on certain folks, especially in, in the kibbutz where they live in a region where there aren't any unrecognized villages, there aren't any Palestinian citizens, there aren't even any Palestinian mis municipalities there. So there's a lot of things they don't see. Um, and so understanding what those blinders are doing to how they understand water is a, an important step to try to figure out how you make those power imbalances most visible, most understandable to, to people so that they can then be righted. First, I would like to thank the panel for raising these issues of, of equality and uh, you know, equal rights to, to such a basic thing as water because um, after my uh, month in the West Bank where the settlements are green and, and swimming pools and water running down the gutters uh, versus the, uh, the Palestinian towns with their small black uh, water tanks and, and very, very little water, um, it, it's a huge itch issue. And um, I think it's the, the key and the, and the thing. So mainly I'm thanking you for bringing it, bringing it up. No question. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to call this session to a close because we're already late for lunch. Um, the speakers are here. I'm sure they'll be delighted to talk with you informally uh, off the podium. Uh, thanks again to all of you and thanks in particular to our three outstanding panelists.